Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ronnie K. O'Dell, who's an associate professor of political science at Seton Hill University. Ronnie K. specializes in research on international organizations, the United Nations, human development, human rights, and the sustainable development goals. She's the co-author of Global Politics, a Toolkit for Learners, and has published several articles in a variety of journals. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, so thank you for joining me today. Me too. Thanks for joining, or thanks for letting me join. Of course. Um, so I think a good place to start, you know, we met at a conference recently, we, we both teach courses on genocide studies. Um, it's a difficult topic and I often joke with people, you know, when I say like, I'm excited for the semester, it's like, you're excited to teach about, you know, genocide studies. Um, but what do you enjoy teaching about, you know, these kinds of difficult subjects? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that question actually, because I often have the same situation really with any of my classes. So I teach genocide studies, but I also teach intro to global politics. I teach American foreign policy. I teach human rights uh, development studies, you know, so lots of different things. And within that, there's all kinds of really challenging uh, topics to talk about. And so it is interesting because I am very excited to talk about these topics with my students, to teach about it, to talk about it with anybody. And it's, it's really challenging issues, global governance issues and problems that our world faces that we really need to address, that we need to, you know, fix. Mm -hmm. And so how can that be exciting? Here's what makes it exciting for me is the idea that we can look at these challenges together to without sort of a blindfold or without, you know, rose tinted glasses, we can say, here are the main global governance problems in our world. Mm -hmm. Here's the problems that humans face, the things that are not great, human rights atrocities, atrocities of mass atrocities, genocide, you know, these kinds of things. Here they are, we can look at them with eyes wide open and say, here's the problem, but then we can actually suggest solutions to that problem. Mm -hmm. So my, um, before my PhD, my undergrad and my master's was in policy analysis. And so whenever I was learning about these issues from the beginning, it was always with a view to how do we look at ways to address the problem? How do we find ways that government or other entities can actually make it better? And there are ways. So that's what is exciting to me. So, you know, it's not, it's not quite as exciting to teach about these issues necessarily or look at these things because it's awful too. But what's exciting to me is that we have a chance to look at it and uh, think of ways to come around and change it. And I'm sure that we'll get into a conversation about, you know, what are those specific issues or what are, the, are those things that we can do? But um, that is what I bring to the, the table whenever I'm teaching about these things or whenever I'm uh, talking about them. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point about coming to this with eyes wide open. Um, I, I start every semester being very clear with my students that when I was in school back in the day, there was still this notion that we looked at the, the world with this kind of fanatic, like fantasy land, like the U S government could do this. It, you know, if, if something goes wrong here, like we can step in, we can do the, the UN will be there like something. And the reality is that, Yes, sometimes there are actions that have taken place and that you know can take place in the future. And there can be these kinds of immediate reactions to ongoing atrocities or other things. But really, when push comes to shove, like the U.S. isn't getting involved in every crisis around the world, nor should we probably. Um, and so pretending like there are clear, easy solutions to some of the most complex problems in the world doesn't help anybody, right? Um, and so starting from that, that place is, I think, really important for students to like understand, look, like, no, these are hard problems. And as I often say, like some of the things that we'll ask, some of the questions we'll have, we may not have answers for right now. Like they're not clear cut answers for all these things. Um, so that's, that's great. Yeah. And just to add to that, the U.S. for sure doesn't always have the correct answers to some of these problems. Sure. So, you know, that's the difference between unilateralism and multilateralism. And I just read an interesting article this morning about how the global South really is stepping in on multilateralism, especially with peace issues, you know, meeting with Ukraine president mm -hmm. um, and discussing the challenge there and really taking the lead in some of these way in some of these things that address these issues like international peace or like international security. 
and the U.S. is is not so much. So that doesn't mean that they can't. But what the important point I think that you bring out is that multilateralism, that engaging everybody from all of their perspectives, it's what's necessary here with global governance. For sure. And sometimes some of these solutions can come from the people that are at the local level, right? Absolutely. Like there are locally led organizations, there are local leaders, there are human rights leaders, there are academics, there are, you know, politicians, like people that are involved at the state and local level that do want to do the right things. There's plenty of people who are doing bad things. Um, but sometimes we we forget about the people that are living that experience day to day and what they can bring to the table um, in offering longer term solutions. Absolutely. And I'll just say one more thing. And then I know we probably have other questions, but, you know, um, I know that you are a huge advocate of civil society organizations being involved in this stuff. I am, too. It's a lot of my research um, that relates to how do civil society organizations be a part of international negotiations, particularly those that are happening at the United Nations, where yep. delegates are coming together to address these issues with public policy. But, you know, how do you incorporate uh, CSOs in that discussion, in that problem? And uh, so I think that's a really interesting and important area of not only research, but just engagement, practical engagement. And one of the things that I do with my students, getting back to your earlier question, is not only talk about how can you know governments create policy to address these issues, to prevent mass atrocities, but how can we do it, actually? How mm -hmm. can we individually become involved in making sure that our societies are places that, that don't um, do those kinds of things. So For sure. I think that's yeah. really important. It's an individual thing, right? Like I tell my students all the time that um, unfortunately, as far as I believe it, there will always be crazy people in the world that have horrible, terrible ideas. And I don't use crazy to be pejorative, but you know, just people who have terrible ideas of genocidal ideology, etc. And they're going to be, you know, people that are going to try to get other people on board with those ideas. But one person, one small group, can't really commit genocide or mass atrocities that well. They need to have a whole host of other people that buy into that rhetoric, that buy into that ideology. And so, like you said, like people can prevent these things from happening even at the very local level just by not buying into that, right? Like being that bulwark against hatred and division and, and violence um, that can come to their communities. Absolutely. And one of the ways that you do that is by learning about it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we teach these challenging subjects. We teach about genocide. We teach about climate change and the terrible effects that that's having on our lives. We teach about mass atrocities in order to understand why they happened, how they happened, and then to say, how do we become involved in making sure this doesn't happen again? Yeah. So to that point, it's actually a good segue. So, you know, thinking about the the challenging topic and, and, and why we teach about these things, you know, personally, I, I try to balance my sense of, you know, as my name suggests, Mike the Idealist, like my idealism, my optimism with like the very real situation that we're dealing with, where there are several crises that are happening right now. There are new crises that are emerging, you know, daily almost. There are new things that we see that are going to happen in a few months ahead of, you know, elections in certain countries, which many countries this year and the next year are going to have elections, which unfortunately may be triggering for violence. Um, we have the Russia-Ukraine conflict. We have, you know, all these different challenges. And so uh, on the one hand, it's like there, there is a lot of progress that's being made in certain areas. And then on the other hand, we're seeing new crises emerge and sometimes older crises that just refuse to be solved, right? They become protracted conflicts. They lead to protracted refugee situations, et cetera. Um, so I'm curious how you balance that in your own teaching and, and research even, just trying to you know, come to this with a little bit of a sense of hope or else if you didn't have any, you probably wouldn't be doing this work anymore. Um, but then also balancing that with the very grim reality of the situation that we're dealing with right now. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it goes back to the training I had in my undergraduate, but also just all the experiences that I've had in my academic career. And I worked for nonprofits for quite a while. And it's, it's really important to approach this work, approach the discussion of the challenges that are happening in the world with that balanced view, with mm -hmm. an ability to say, here's the challenges, here's the problems. We are not going to turn our eye away from it. We're not mm -hmm. going to pretend it's not happening. We're going to we're going to sort of shore up our strength and, and look at it. But we're also going to 
um, keep a sense of hope that we can do something to address these issues mm -hmm. and that we will be able to find solutions to the problems. And I think that that the important thing there is actually being willing to, you know, jump into the deep end, I guess, as it were, mm -hmm. sort of get our hands dirty, right? It's easy to step back, to look at the problems and to say, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. Right. It's just these atrocities keep happening over and over again. But actually, once you get into it, once you start saying, I'm going to be a part of this solution, it's empowering and in a way creates the the ability for us to address it. Whereas if you just sit back and you, you're you're unwilling, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it won't get us anywhere. And, you know, it reminds me, I was looking up some stuff um, for one of my classes upcoming. I'm teaching a human rights and genocide class, as I always do every year. And I was looking up some some of the history behind the genocide convention earlier. And I um, was reminded that of how difficult it was to get the U.S. to ratify and sign on to the genocide convention, yeah, right? 40 years. So, yeah. So, right. Exactly. It took until 1988, 1948 to 1988 mm -hmm. for the U.S. to do that. And one of the really important people who made that happen was Senator William Proxmire from mm -hmm. Wisconsin. And he gave something like 3000 speeches over like the every topic. day. He gave a speech on the Senate floor. It was crazy. Yeah. And so that's to answer your question about, you know, how do we how do we do this? How do we face these challenges? You just have perseverance. You just have yeah. that hope. You just keep going until you get to the point where you have either achieve, you know, you never achieve it actually, but you get to a point where you um, can at least say that you have succeeded in some way. And it, you just remind remind yourself of people like that, right? Who did not were, would not let go, that would not stop, just kept with the speeches consistently yep. to get the U.S. to finally sign on to that convention. Yeah. And interestingly, um, the Proxmire Act that eventually did pass um, was, I think, one of the main sponsors of it was Joe Biden at the time, Senator Joe Biden. Oh, interesting. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. So actually, I show in my class a, a short clip from the like debate on the Senate floor about that Proxmire speaks. And then, you know, Biden talks about it and actually passing. Um, and yeah, it's interesting, you know, the connections there, but yeah, like that would never have happened without Proxmire doing that work, you know, exactly. it's like Lemkin's work to get the, the international community to understand that a, we need a new term for the term genocide because it, it's different than other crimes and B, we need a convention to prevent and punish this crime. Yeah. Um, for sure. I, I, um, I don't know if you use this film in your classes at all, but the, the documentary watchers of the sky. Um, but it's a great documentary that shows like the history of, of Lemkin and, you know, coming up with the definition and a lot of his lobbying efforts. And then okay. it, it, it showcases a few other actors as well. Somebody who is a survivor of the Rwandan genocide, who is then working in Darfur. It shows, um, Louis Mirano Ocampo, the first ICC prosecutor and deciding to indict Bashir. Um, it shows Ben Ferenz, who is one of the youngest Nuremberg prosecutors, um, and a lot of the work that he was doing to try to get, um, the crime of aggression to be banned. Um, but the, the term, the, the phrase watches of the sky comes from Ferenz. He talks about this, um, case with, um, Tycho, who was this like astronomer who was out there kind of like mapping the stars every night. And that finally somebody came to him like, why are you doing this? Like, what's the utility of this? He was like, well, it's so that the next person who comes to do, you know, more star mapping doesn't have to start from scratch. Like I'm, I'm building this like repository so that they don't have to start from the beginning. And Friends talks about how, like, that's how we build international law. It's like building blocks on building blocks. Um, that's, I think that's a great approach is that, you know, we're doing the work now in hopes that more of the work will be done down the line. Like, we're not going to solve all these problems today. But if we can do something about one of them today, maybe tomorrow it can be used as an example. Um, but yeah, that's right. You know, and all this also reminds me so much of Eleanor Roosevelt, who is so instrumental in making the Universal Declaration of Human mm -hmm. Rights happen. And one of the things that she said is that the way that human rights actually become protected and not um, violated is by every one of us 
at home, in our schools, in our families, you know, in our neighborhoods, amongst our community, talking about it and making sure we yeah. keep it alive. So if, if it doesn't happen at the local level, it won't happen at the international level. For sure. And I think, you know, something that people forget about is in the like timeline of human existence, even from like us having civilizations, not even like early humans till now, from 1948 till now is a very small window between yeah. the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, as well as, you know, a number of other things. Um, but so, yeah, it's this very short window in our entire existence. And to think that we're going to be able to master that perfectly, especially when the UN was first created, when the UDHR was created, you know, most of the continent of Africa was still under colonial rule, right? So there was like already gaps while we were writing these words. Um, but we've made a lot of progress and no, it's not perfect, but you know, things are getting better, you know, seemingly every year, hopefully. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So going back to your question, you know, how do we keep going when all of these atrocities are happening? Well, we have a perspective on it, right? And we make sure that we understand the structure of the world in which we live and also the mm -hmm. history, what got us to where we are and, um, and understanding how complicated these issues are actually makes it um, easier for us to look at and to say, here, we can do something about it. For sure. I think your point about history is so important. And it's something that uh, pains me a little bit in, in my cl classes, because, you know, when I was in school, I was learning about Rwanda for the first time. And it kind of disturbed me that it happened during my lifetime. I mean, I was obviously a younger kid, but it happened during my lifetime and I didn't know about it. Like I never learned about it in school. My family didn't know about it, nothing. And then Darfur happened while I was in college and got very involved in the, you know, Save Darfur movement and anti-genocide movement and all these things. Um, and we did a lot of work over those last, you know, 20 years to raise more awareness about some of these crimes. And students today still don't know about Rwanda and don't know about Darfur. And now you see what's happening in Sudan again. And, you know, there's, you know, civil war happening um, and very, you know, real risk of atrocities. I mean, atrocities are already being perpetrated in Darfur, but potentially genocide as well. Um, and it's like, you know, because we didn't have a lot of justice and accountability, you know, over the years from early 2003 till now, um, that's what happens. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think it's so important. That's one of the reasons why I was excited to do this discussion with you, but also why I teach genocide classes and why I, as much as I can speak and talk about this issue, because knowing about the, the past, knowing mm -hmm. about the present, you know, knowing about what is going on in the world is so important. So often, I mean, I guess I would say something like 80 to 90% of my students will say, yes, they've heard of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. but that's to them something that has happened way, way in the past, right. you know, and it's never again, of course, because yep. that's what we said, you know, that's what they've heard, that that uh, that statement, but then they hear about Rwanda, then they hear about Bosnia, then they hear about Darfur, then they mm -hmm. hear about uh, the Rohingya, then they hear about the Uyghurs, then they hear yep. about the Yazidi, and they're just shocked. Yeah. And it's really unfortunate because these are people who are, you know, in their 20s and they have not had any kind of introduction into the fact that this can and does happen consistently. So yeah. the point about knowing that, though, is not to sort of like bathe in the terrors of uh, human history, because sure. if we if we did, you know, going back to your point, are we going to get lost in despair? No, the point of it is to say, ask ourselves, why does this happen in human right. societies? And how can we make sure it doesn't happen mm -hmm. now and in the future? So that's and what can we learn from these different episodes, right? Because yeah. they're all different. Um, one of the pieces that I assigned to my students is uh, David Moshman's piece about um, conceptual constraints on thinking about genocide studies. And he focuses on how the Holocaust is this like preeminent version of what people think about when they think of genocide. And because of that, we've put the term genocide in a Holocaust box and people can't think about other crises as genocide. Um, but yeah, like how do, how do we take the lessons learned from these horrible, you know, episodes, as you said, throughout history and even today, you know, things that are still happening right now um, and figure out, OK, well, A, can we do something better about what's going on right now? And, you know, B, how do we deal with the next thing? Um, but yeah, it is this it's. 
it's very disheartening to to think about how every semester, you know, some students hear about things more than others. And I have some students that come, you know, they're already a human rights major. So they're, they're studying these things. Some of them aren't. Um, but yeah, that, you know, unfortunately, they're not learning about these things through the normal course of life, right? Either on their own through the, you know, the, the various you know methods that they can learn about things on the internet, news articles, et cetera, or in school, like it's not being taught at all. Um, and I think that's one of the gaps that we have in this country is some states have moved to include some level of Holocaust education in you know middle and high school curricula, but it stops there, right? It often doesn't go beyond the Holocaust. And even then, it might just be you know a small section. So you, how much are you really learning? Yeah. Absolutely. All the more reason for us to do things like this. But also there are wonderful organizations out there at uh, Seton Hill University where I teach. There is the National Center for Catholic Holocaust Education, mm. which specifically does support educators in coming up with curriculum to teach Holocaust and genocide studies. So just making sure that people know about that information mm -hmm. and know about the that those um those 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 teaching materials and support is out there is a step in addressing that problem for sure for sure no i agree um so switching gears a little bit i know a lot of your work at least um from your bio um focuses on the sustainable development goals and the un's response to some of these you know long-term time horizon you know goals that we have um so i'm curious I'm, I'm assuming some of your research at least is focused on goal 16 peace justice and accountability um, as that interrelates with this work. Um, I'm just curious, you know, from your research, what you're looking into, how do you think the, the progress on the SDGs is going? That is a great and challenging question. For sure. Um, so I think that we're on progress. And then I'll make maybe a couple other points uh, about some of the other research that I'm. Um, and I'm maybe let's we should back up and explain what the SDGs are. And oh, short. that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the Sustainable Development Goals. There are these 17 goals, 169 targets that were negotiated between between 2012 and 2015 at the United Nations, with member states being very heavily involved. Um, various conferences and various meetings that happen. I mean, we could go into that, but you know, that's all you really need to know. Um, one thing I love, and this is one of the main things that I study is how, as I mentioned earlier, how civil society organizations, mm -hmm. NGOs, you know, non-state actors, how were they involved in that process? Because they're very much a part of what happens when we try to achieve these goals. So, you know, sure. it's the SDGs, like, number one is reduce poverty. And it really it's eliminate uh, all forms of poverty everywhere, right? And then there's several, many other kind of um, connections. But if these goals are just being discussed and negotiated by governments at higher levels, then that's gonna be a real challenge for achievement and implementation. And also, you know, the conceptualization is um, essential for for everybody to be involved. So that's what I'm studying, and what I what much of my research is uh, in. How do we make sure that everyone's voice is included, and how do we make sure that it's included in an equitable manner too, mm -hmm. um, across countries and across uh, issue areas? But it, having been agreed upon in 2015, the UN General Assembly of um, 193 countries came together and said, okay, we have these 17 goals that we want to achieve and we're going to work toward achieving them. And mm -hmm. then we're going to figure out how to do that through all kinds of different projects, you know, within country and between countries, right? So that's the basics about the sustainable development goals. And, you know, if you want to add anything, but that's sort of- the No, that's, that's a great description. Um, and and then, I guess the only thing I'll add is that they're the follow on to, as some people may have heard, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, which ended at the same time that then we were moving towards the SDGs. So Yeah, that's yeah. right. So the Millennium Development Goals were created at the beginning of the millennium, right? Mm -hmm. 2000 is when they were passed. Those were only eight goals, you know, so they morphed into 15. But they the idea is to have a time frame. So right. MDGs said we're going to try to achieve these by 2015. We got close on some. Mm -hmm. Most we didn't quite achieve. But as the 2015 deadline was approaching, that's when the negotiations started. And then 2015 they uh, were replaced with the SDGs. And part of what happened between the MDGs and SDGs uh, kind of, you know, interestingly and so importantly is that there is a, a introduction of sustainability and the idea of, you know, environmental protection mm -hmm. in 
uh, several ways. So the SDGs are meant to be achieved by 2030. So you asked about progress. You know, though there has been an enormous amount of effort to try to achieve these SDGs as they have been conceptualized, and at least to try to try to measure the SDGs. So each target, 168 targets um, that were associated with these goals, was connected with an indicator. You know, so mm -hmm. sort of an indicator like you know, if we're going to reduce poverty, what does poverty mean? Well, usually, right. typically, you know, we think of absolute poverty as two dollars a day. So we're going to start try to measuring that and try to say, let's get. Um, the, the number of people living on less than $2 a day, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, if you can imagine, if you bought coffee this morning, it was probably $5, right? So, you know, <laughs> like you think about two, what it means to live on $2 a day. So let's, let's reduce that. Let's eliminate that, right? And so let's try to measure that. Um, so all of these different ways of um, uh, measuring. So we've got these targets, we've got these indicators. Countries have come together through uh, it, it, their agreement, bilateral agreements, uh, the UNDP, the World Bank, the IMF, these big organizations have been implementing projects. And, you know, there's a there's a worldwide concerted effort to try to achieve these goals. Now, there's a lot of challenges in achieving these goals. And so I, I'd say we're, we're, we're as a world and sort of locally making progress. Mm -hmm. I'm from Pittsburgh. And so Pittsburgh itself is a, one of those cities that has signed on to the SDGs. You don't have to be a state to sign on to the SDGs and agree to them. Um, co com companies have signed on to the SDGs to try to, uh, to um, agree and to implement them. So there is this worldwide effort. So, so we're making some progress, you know, not doing very well uh, on other things. One thing that has been a huge setback is COVID. Obviously, yeah. those two years of just um, limits in the ability to gain uh, gainful employment, to have gainful employment or to um, access traded goods. And uh, that is still a huge factor that has uh, set back the goals. So uh, there are certainly reports out there. The UN itself creates these reports that suggests that much more effort is needed in order to make sure that we, we, that we do put enough um, resources and money and um, maybe more importantly, political will into yeah. achieving these goals. And so that's kind of where we are on progress. Great. No, I appreciate that. And I think it's, it's another thing that a lot of people don't fully know about, you know, they may hear it in passing that these things are happening, but not really understand what the SDGs are. So mm -hmm. that's, it's, it's good to talk about. Um, in that same vein, though, of, you know, getting people to know about these things, know about the past, know about um, how some of these issues affect uh, people around the world, something that, you know, sparked our initial first conversation, you know, when we met at this conference was this idea of teaching through empathy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in that context, it was teaching about, you know, through genocide studies and getting people to care about these issues and care about the people that suffered from these atrocities. Um, but I think, you know, empathy can apply to a lot of other things as well, including, you know, like progress on the SDGs, right? Like you may not know anybody who only lives on $2 a day, but there are plenty of people out there, millions of people out there that do. Um, and so making progress on that, you know, you have to care at some level about those people that you may never meet in your life. Um, similarly to, you know, a genocide or, you know, a mass atrocity situation that happens on the other side of the world. So I wonder if you just talk a little bit about some of the prog, you know, the things that you've seen in your shifts in teaching by including that kind of empathetic lens. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. So yeah, the, the place that we met was um, talking a little bit about these kinds of issues, at least how does the UN respond to mass atrocities mm -hmm. is the, basically what, what it was talking about. And um, I have been very concerned in how I present issues like genocide or climate change or, uh, you know, there, there's so many other issues out there that, that you can um, talk about related to this, that it, in presenting the information, it's so crucial to not only present it from here's a whole bunch of knowledge about it. Sure. But to say, how does it relate to our lives? How can we connect it with our own sense of well-being or our own understanding of 
the feelings that that one might uh, mm -hmm. encounter in a given situation, right? That, I mean, that's what empathy is. It's it's trying to put yourself into another person's place and to understand what they're going through and to see to the extent which you can, you know, feel their experience. Now, sometimes that's absolutely impossible, right? I mean, there's no way to be able to really step into the a person's experience when they have uh, gone through a mass atrocity or even you know refugees fleeing ukraine recently mm -hmm. i mean there's there's no way but at least to try to get to a point where we connect as human beings and make that real clear um understanding that it's not just something that's happening outside of us but that that it's something that is um, very much importantly connected to, to you, us as humans and human existence. So there's a whole bunch of ways in which I have changed over the years. You know, after you, when you start out a PhD, you, um, you have so much knowledge, right, in your, in your brain or from a master's program, you have so much knowledge. And so when you start teaching, you just feel like you need to just download that knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. and just to, you focus only on that. But at some point, I realized that it's it's really important to couch that in a particular way, and so yeah. so I think that um, finding ways to include empathy, to include connection, is is so important. And one of the things that I have done in in my courses is I start out my courses with a discussion of empathy, with a discussion of um, and sort sort of a a section on how do we ensure that we take time to recognize what is actually happening mm -hmm. in the situations that, that we're looking at. You know, what is the experience, particularly if it is genocide, how do we recognize the, even just recognizing that it was this horrific event that people went through? Um, how do we honor them, especially right. the, the, the people who have gone through this and the, the victims and the survivors? How do we honor their memory. So I start that out and then I uh, implement it throughout the course. And I'll just give you one example because I, I could go on about this forever, but I use, I teach using the um, book, The Sunflower by Simon uh, mm -hmm. Wiesenthal, who it's just a, a little tiny book. He was um, uh, in World War II. He was in a prison and um, jailed by Nazis. And so he was um, um, had an interaction with him. And so he, he was a survivor for, of mm -hmm. the Holocaust. So he wrote this book later afterward. And the book relates one of his experiences when he was um, in a particular place where his jailer, this uh, a Nazi um, uh, person who was sort of o overseeing what he was doing, becomes sick and he has to kind of take care of him. And it's just a young kid, in fact, uh, the, this uh, um, Nazi personnel. And he becomes sick and he's on his deathbed. He becomes mm -hmm. that sick. And so he asks Simon if he would forgive him for what he had done. And so he tells him some of the things that he'd done, including setting a building on fire when there was a whole bunch of people inside and wow. you know not allowing them to, to get out. So Simon then uh, grapples with this. And that's what he writes about in the book. He says, should I forgive mm -hmm. this person when he's on his deathbed for something? It wasn't committed against me, although I'm in a situation where I'm um, experiencing some terrible things. But do I have the ability to forgive for right. other people? Should I be a part of that? And it, also he felt anger. You know, should he even forgive that person? So he grapples with it. And he talks about it in the book. And then he has about 20 other people try to answer the question. You know, uh, re politicians and some some uh, people that uh, um, Desmond Tutu, I think, is mm -hmm. one of the people who responds. And so they just give a sort of little two to three page response of how sure. they would answer the question. So all that to say, I have my students read that and then they answer the question. They write That's a little great. essay. And that's the thing that sticks with them the most is putting themselves in, mm -hmm. in this case, Simon's space, you know, place and saying, what would I do if that was yeah. um, my, and, you know, we also look at uh, videos of survivors talking mm -hmm. about their experience and stories and we read stories. And that's one thing that I didn't do in the beginning, 
But I do very much now because I think it's so important to take our head out of this big sort of macro level saying, yeah, a million people were killed in this particular genocide to say, well, what was it like for one person? Mm -hmm. And how can we um, understand that and connect with it? And then I do a whole bunch of other things to, throughout the course, but I, but that's what I think really makes a difference. And hopefully, again, going back to our earlier discussion and conversation, hopefully takes it with them to wherever right. they go, whether they're going to a company or to a government or to a nonprofit or whatever they're gonna do in their career, that they'll remember this and that they will be a part of solution to sure. these kinds of problems. So how, yeah. what do you do? That was a long answer to the question. No, that's a good answer though. I, you know, I think um, definitely, you know, I find that some of the the videos and the documentaries and the like the survivor stories um, help because it it creates a, a better connection than just reading about something in a book, right? Um, especially when you can hear somebody directly talking about their own lived experience. Um, it's just different. Um, and just as humans, I think, you know, we, we generally empathize better when you can see somebody in front of your face, see their emotions, see their, you know, how their voice changes when they're explaining something like just basic things. Um, but I have found that, you know, some students deal better with asking more open-ended questions with a, like, what do you think? How would you deal with this? Those kinds of, you know, questions, if you were in those, you know, this person's shoes. Um, and some students struggle with that. And I think it's a, a testament and a challenge to academia more broadly that we spend so much time on the analytical focus that sometimes some of that human connection gets lost. And the, you know, while yes, sometimes like you need that analytical brain to be, you know, fully functioning and working, you need that empathetic side as well. And it, it you know, so many courses, you know, thinking back to when I was in school, like the way that we teach and the way that you expect people to remember information and then be able to regurgitate it back to you and how it's being tested on an exam, like it's very specific, finite pieces of information, not necessarily the whole picture or you know, not even the exact issue, but how would you deal with this in general? Like, how does that make you feel? Um, and there's a place for both of them, I think. I, I don't think it's, you know, one is better than the other necessarily. Um, but I think we need to find ways to include both, especially when you're teaching about courses like human rights and genocide studies or development or whatever it is, because, you know, if you're just thinking of it from a purely analytical standpoint, you know, you're taking that whole human condition out of it. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. The holistic element, I guess, mm -hmm. of education and ensuring that we're not only, I mean, knowledge is important, obviously, right? That's what we're, we're um, that that's part of what um, I do, that what is guides me and leads me mm -hmm. as a, a an educator is somebody who is very excited to learn more and to express that um, uh, excitement and engage with uh, education in lots of different ways. So knowledge is important, but I do think that holistically looking at why we're learning about a certain topic, mm -hmm. how it relates to human society, human well-being, human interaction, what it means for my life, what, you know, what am I going to do with this in the future is crucial. And, and like you said uh, very eloquently, I think that that is sometimes missing. So you for know, sure. let's try to bring that back in. Yeah. And I'll just say one more thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with the last word of anything else that you'd like to discuss before we close out. But, you know, I think there's a through line that's so important through how this work is, you know, learned, how it's taught, how it, you know, is engaged, and then how it gets implemented down, you know, stream in, you know, the, the largest setting, whether that's U.S. politics, multilateral politics at the United Nations, at the African Union, wherever it is, where, as you, as you talked about before, like, historically civil society and some of those other actors have not been included in some of these conversations yet they're the ones on the ground implementing these things and i think that goes to it again is you know a lot of the programmatic work that i've done over the years and a lot of the policy work has centered on let's hear what the people on the ground in the country that are at the local level that are going to be most impacted by x y or z policy what do they have to say about this like what is their opinion because somebody in New York or somebody in Brussels or somebody in London or DC or New York, wherever, like talking about these things absent of that conversation is a problem. And I think 
it's similar to you know how people can learn about these things if you're just reading about the analysis of what happened in a certain crisis without any of that human connection you lose that oh absolutely i couldn't agree more and i here's what i was thinking while you were talking about that the work that i do with my model un students mm. which i'm so proud of it's one of the things that i love to do you know the most important thing i think that i do maybe in my job is uh, this model un which is you know for the listeners who might not know is is a, an organization that simulates what the united nations does mm. in a, a, as a way to prepare students to work in international negotiations. So I meet with students throughout the year. We meet weekly to learn about negotiation, diplomacy, all of the kinds of challenges that the world is facing, how the United Nations structure is structured and functions. And then we learn, we are assigned a particular country to represent. And so we learn all about that. You know, I train the students. Uh, the students also, you know, basically train themselves too. We're all working together. And then we go to a model United Nations conference, which for four intense days, 10 to 12 hour days, sometimes mm. students then simulate what is happening at the UN every year where delegates from all countries are coming to the UN to say, we have these problems, you know, climate change, carbon emissions, human atrocities, whatever it is, how do we solve them? And so this, the students simulate that. Now, the reason I bring this up is because when they start out, students do have this feeling of disillusionment. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like, you know, it, it's too big of a problem. You know, right. how, how can we actually address this? There's too many things. But ironically, learning about the complexity of the problem and then going through a simulation in which you work with in, in some cases, these simulations have thousands of other students that come from anywhere on the world. So they come together, they work together in these groups, and they come up with solutions. It empowers them. Right. It creates a sense of, I can do this, and we can do this together. You know, mm -hmm. and, it, and in some way, it also shows that really the only, the main challenge, like I mentioned earlier, is political will and, sure. you know, overcoming that. So in the, including and empowering people. Um, whether it's students who are learning about international negotiations to become involved, whether getting back to your point, civil society organizations mm -hmm. or people on the ground are in involved in these negotiations or discussions or implementations. That's what's important and crucial to making our world a better place. Yeah, I think that's a, a great way to end this. And I think you know, so many of those challenges, like you said, like, it's, again, it's it's in some way, it's empathy, right? They're empathizing with how difficult these challenges are to solve. They're empathizing with how difficult it is to engage in negotiations with people who have different competing, you know, narratives or competing ideas or competing, you know, end results. Um, but it's also a challenge of, again, like, you know, students aren't learning about genocide in schools. They're also not learning about peace, right? Like, we, I always say, you're, your lessons in peace in school start with, you know, sharing, right? When you're a very little kid, you learn like how to negotiate, like sharing your toys. Maybe you learn about Kingy and nonviolence, like with Martin Luther King. Mm. That's about it. Like we don't have a lot of lessons on negotiations or peace or peace building or any of that development kind of work. Um, and I think it's to the disservice because then people don't understand it. And it's, it's like a cycle, right? Like we, you keep talking about political will and in order to get the political will, you have to have the people, at least in democracies, that are voting in people into power that care about these issues. And until the people know about these issues and care about these issues and can empathize with, you know, the people that these issues are going to impact the most, we're not going to see politicians that focus on those things because they're not a priority for their constituents. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Well, I guess at the least that we can do is get this out there so that people can listen to it and hear it. And I know that Absolutely. I have resources, I'm sure you do, that we can maybe put in, I don't know if you call them show notes or something, but when you post this- Yeah, but at least in the video, I'll put them in the description for sure. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so that'd be great. That's what, okay. that's what we can do now. And then there's so many other things that we can do, isn't there? So- Yeah, and like, you know, as you said, you know, that everybody can do something. And I think that's a really important takeaway is that, you know, we don't expect the random, you know, person that could be, you know, on the street and, Pittsburgh or wherever to solve all the world's problems, but they can do something even at their very local level. And I think that's yeah. just an important takeaway. Yeah, absolutely.
Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And thank you for we'll having me. This has been fun.